So um, we've covered uh, a large number of transformations, the displacive transformations, Wiedmannstein ferrite, bainite and acicular ferrite, uh, martensite, uh, allotriomorphic ferrite. I haven't covered this, but don't worry about it. And we'll deal with uh, perlite now. Okay? Uh, and you're very familiar with perlite. Uh, it's one of the microstructures that you study you know, in part 1a and so on. And it's a diffusional transformation. There's no question about it. It's a reconstructive transformation. Uh, and it forms at relatively high temperatures on your time temperature transformation diagram. It looks like this. So if I partially transform to perlite, then you see these colonies of perlite. They're, they're kind of uh, spheroidal. In this case, we are not resolving the uh, lamellae because it's a low magnification image. But if you look at that transmission electron micrograph, you see sort of uh, layers of uh, austenite and fer uh, sorry, not austenite and ferrite, cementite and ferrite. And those are not separate layers. They are connected in three dimensions. So each of these colonies uh, that you see here is actually a bicrystal of ferrite and cementite in three dimensions. And when we section it, it appears like we have alternating layers. And this is quite important because although the strength is determined by the spacing between the cementite, uh, the toughness is determined by the size of the perlite colony. Okay? Because uh, you know, if, it, if the crystallography is the same across the colony, then uh, the crack will not be deflected sufficiently within the colony. Uh, you have to go to another colony before it deflects, a cleavage crack. Okay? So to get better toughness, you need to refine the size of the colony. Strength will definitely increase when you reduce the interlamellar spacing. Do you recognize what this structure is? Have you, did you go to the Olympics? Yeah. So this is uh, what will become the future Eiffel Tower. This is the construction by ArcelorMittal. Uh, and uh, it really is actually quite beautiful. Um, see all that structural steel? Uh, most of the structural steel that you see will consist of a mixture of ferrite and perlite. Okay? Uh, so both ferrite and perlite are extremely important phases in the vast majority of the steel that we consume. This uh, was the tallest building uh, when I visited it during its construction stage. Uh, this uh, actually is my first ever PhD student. This is uh, in uh, Taipei, in Taiwan. And uh, he was also in our group as the construction engineer. So this uh, is built in an earthquake zone. You know, Taiwan is in an earthquake zone. And at the time, it was the tallest building in the world, 101 floors. Now, the problem with very tall buildings is that, uh, you know, elastic strains build up, right? So if you've got wind, etc., they will actually flex a lot. So at the top, without doing certain engineering, which I will show you, you will get a deflection of two meters, okay? which is huge. So this is the same reason that you know, if you look at a very large aircraft on the ground, uh, its wings are floppy. right? But when it's flying, they're not, because it's elastic strains accumulating over a long distance. So it doesn't actually fly by flapping its wings, all right? but you will see a massive deflection on the big transport aircraft. So how do you, how do you um, cope with this? Well, what you do is you hang a 90-ton steel ball on, on the right from the top uh, using these very strong ropes. And that ball damps the vibration, so it reduces to a few millimeters from meters. Okay? So these ropes are made from perlite. Okay? So you, you transform into perlite and then you draw them. And can you guess what sort of strength they would have? 
here, uh, one gigapascal, two, uh, one uh, and two, two is nearer the mark, yeah, but you need them to be really strong, okay? So they're approaching three gigapascals in strength, and you know, the ductility isn't all that high, but the fact that it's in the form of ropes which are twined together gives you the safety, okay? So steel rope, uh, the steel ropes that you see everywhere are basically perlite which has been deformed heavily into wire form, okay? And uh, th this is, uh, you can get a range of steel ropes. This is the longest single span bridge in the world. Uh, do you know where it is? So wh what that means is that you can go two, ki two kilometers without any supporting structure underneath. Again, this is in an earthquake zone. It's between Kobe and Awasi Island in Japan. And I've been there and I've seen a displacement from a previous earthquake by almost a meter. So this is designed to survive uh, very large earthquakes. And the amount of perlitic wire that's used here, uh, 3 gigapascal strength perlitic wire, and this time it's not twined because for stiffness they are all uh, parallel strands. Okay? Amount of steel wire used here, you could go around the earth seven times. Okay? So the diameter of this is huge. Okay, you know, bigger than the uh, height of a human being. And inside that, uh, you maintain an inert atmosphere uh, because you don't want corrosion reactions, etc., going on. Okay? So this is really high technology, spanning two kilometers without any support underneath. Oh, uh, the slide said it was Japan. Uh, I forgot about that. Okay, so... Uh, bas basically, uh, we now have a two-phase mixture to deal with. So, you know, um, nucleation must involve both the nucleation of ferrite and austenite. Right? Uh, sorry, ferrite and cementite. Because perlite involves the cooperative growth of two phases at a common transformation front with the austenite. And this, this shows you that even in the very early stages of, uh, of transformation, you have both of these phases growing together. Okay? And this is a simplification of the growth of perlite. So we have uh, these uh, layers of, uh, of uh, cementite and ferrite, and a common transformation front with the gamma. And what is the average composition of the perlite compared with the composition of the alloy? Do I expect the composition of the austenite to change during the growth of perlite? No. Okay. So um, the average composition of the two-phase mixture is more or less the same as that of your um, alloy. And therefore, you don't get any long-range uh, change in the composition of the austenite. And basically ferrite has a low solubility for carbon and cementite of course can absorb huge quantities of carbon. It's, a, it's an iron carbide. So what we have is the carbon that cannot be accommodated in the ferrite uh, goes towards the cementite which absorbs it. Right? So the diffusion direction here is totally different from all the other cases that we've done. It's actually parallel to the transformation front. Okay? It, it's still diffusion in the volume of the austenite, but it's parallel to the um, transformation front. And what, what would be the diffusion distance? Between yeah, so it's related to the interplanar, spa uh, sorry, interlamella spacing here, S. Okay? And it'll be some fraction of that because, you know, you've got this diffusion happening in both, both directions over here. But we'll assume that it's, uh, it's uh, interlamellar spacing, okay? And when you do a growth rate calculation here, 
it doesn't matter whether you do a growth rate calculation for the cementite or for, for the ferrite from the austenite, they will be the same because these are actually growing together. Okay. So, um, we will again assume that there is local equilibrium at the interface and the compositions we are interested in now uh, are those of the two product phases in equilibrium with austenite. So, C gamma theta is the composition of the austenite that is in equilibrium with cementite because the diffusion is happening through the austenite. And C gamma alpha is the composition of the gamma that is in equilibrium with alpha. And the diffusion happens in the austenite because this concentration is larger than this value here. So it's driven by the difference in those two concentrations in the austenite. Is everyone happy with that? Okay, if, I, if I go back um, to, well, we've got the diagram here as well. So the composition here will be the composition of the austenite that is in equilibrium with ferrite here. And the composition here will be the composition of austenite in equilibrium with cementite. And it's this difference here which drives the flux. Okay. Okay, so let's let's treat the problem uh, you know in terms of uh, the growth of cementite. Uh, we can do this equally well with the growth of ferrite. They are both growing uh, at the same rate. So we have here the composition of the cementite, which is approximately you know uh, 25 atomic percent of carbon or 6.67 weight percent of carbon, right? Uh, so it's very high, and we've got a flux of carbon here which is going from the solubility of carbon in austenite in equilibrium with ferrite and the towards the solubility of uh, carbon in austenite which is in equilibrium with cementite. And we have the same sort of equations that we've dealt with before that on, uh, on the top left hand side you have the rate at which carbon is being absorbed by the cementite. Okay? This time the you know we're not partitioning carbon into the austenite, but we are absorbing it into the cementite. Uh, so it's it's uh, this difference here. Uh, you know, if you think about the, that concentration profile being displaced a little bit, then that's the amount of carbon that you've absorbed uh, per unit time. Okay? So is everyone happy with the left hand side? And on the right hand side, we are dealing with uh, the arrival of carbon to the interface and that's given by the gradient, which is C gamma alpha minus C gamma theta divided by the interlamellar spacing. And that quantity A is because it's not strictly the interlamellar spacing, you know, it's, it's some fraction of the interlamellar spacing, all right? But We'll assume that A is equal to 1, right? And uh, I've done that in your notes as well. And the diffusion distance is fixed, right? It's the interlamellar spacing. So how do you expect the growth rate uh, to vary with time? Constant, right? So perlite grows at a constant rate because the overall composition of the perlite is the same, basically, as that of the austenite. And diffusion is parallel to the interface and the diffusion distance is fixed as the interlamellar spacing. Okay. So bas basically the problem is solved, right? We've got the, you know, I just need to shift the, um, this composition term here and I've got the velocity as a function of the diffusion coefficient, uh, the uh, phase diagram terms and the interlamellar spacing. Can you see any difficulties? Don't yeah, we, we don't have a value for the interlamellar spacing. And furthermore, you know, if the interlamellar spacing goes to zero, the velocity goes to infinity. It's the same sort of problem we had with uh, Wiedmannstein ferrite, that we have a function, uh, 
where we have the velocity as a function of the interlamellar spacing, but we don't have an explicit velocity, right? We can plot the velocity as a function of interlamellar spacing, and it will basically be infinite at zero spacing and taper downwards as the spacing increases. Okay, so we need some uh, some theory uh, for for the interlamellar spacing. How how can we proceed? Layers, yeah, very, very good. So, during the growth of perlite, these interfaces actually have a cost, okay? Uh, and we haven't taken account of that cost because if I make my interlamellar spacing very, very small, then there's a huge amount of interface per unit volume, right? Okay, so we need to work out how the, inter uh, how the amount of interface per unit volume varies as a function of the interlamellar spacing. In order to work out the amount of surface per unit volume, I'll draw a cube of a perlite colony. Containing uh, cementite lamellae. So here's uh, here's one cementite lamella, and another one on this face, and one in the middle. Okay. So here we have two interlamellar spacings, two S, and the cube is of sides to S. Therefore, the total interfacial area between cementite and ferrite area is equal to 4 because there are 4 of these interfaces inside the cube times 2S squared, 2S squared, which is 16S squared. And the volume of the cube is equal to 8s cubed. And therefore, the amount of surface per unit volume, so this is the surface per unit volume, is equal to 16s squared or 8s cubed, which is equal to 2 over s. So although I've done this for a cube, this is quite a, a general relationship between the amount of surface and the interlamellar spacing. And these interfaces have a certain cost. Uh, so um, we, if I multiply this by the interfacial energy per unit area, then the cost of interfaces is equal to sigma alpha theta, which is the interfacial energy per unit area between ferrite and cementite, multiplied by 2 over s, because that's the amount of surface per unit volume. So supposing that delta G is the magnitude of the chemical driving force of chemical driving force force for transformation then the effective driving force delta G dashed will become delta G less the cost of creating interfaces and delta G dashed will become zero when S becomes a critical spacing SC, in which case we can write uh, delta G will be 2 sigma alpha theta over the critical spacing. 
So this equation now can be rewritten as delta g dashed is equal to 2 sigma alpha theta into uh, 1 over the critical spacing minus the actual spacing there. So this can also be written as 2 sigma alpha theta. If I take uh, 1 upon sc out common, then that is 1 minus sc over s. And that is rather like the equation we derived uh, in an earlier lecture for Wiedmann-Stein ferrite, because we can scale the velocity that we deduced earlier by this quantity here uh, to account for the cementite ferrite interfaces that are created during transformation. We simply scale our equation with the term 1 minus sc over s, and that will give us a curve which looks like this. All right? So the growth rate as a function of the interlamellar spacing, and you get a maximum in the curve, and the maximum in the curve is when the actual spacing is twice the critical spacing. Okay. So once again, uh, we don't have any theory to pick a point on that curve, but it seems reasonable that it should grow at the maximum rate possible. Okay. Now, the theory that we've done is for iron carbon alloys. And when I start adding alloying elements, things get really complicated. All right? So I'm not going to actually cover it, but all that theory is available. Um, what I will explain is that when we add substitutional elements, there's also another mechanism of diffusion that plays a role. Right? Uh, so at the moment, we have considered diffusion through the volume of the austenite ahead of the interface. But the interface between the components of perlite and austenite is actually quite incoherent. All right? So there is an easy diffusion path along the interface, which also contributes to the diffusion flux. So we have our equation where we are taking account of the flux through the volume of the austenite. Right? You know, that's, uh, that's the flux that's uh, uh, maintaining the compositions at the interface constant, right? So that we satisfy local equilibrium. All we have to do is add any other flux term to that, because that's also contributing to the diffusion process, which is maintaining the composition's constant. Okay? So it isn't complicated to take account both of the volume diffusion flux and the boundary diffusion flux. Okay? And then, then we will have a slightly more complicated equation, but we are able to uh, work out how much of the material goes through the boundary itself and how much through the volume. So if you are at a high temperature, do you think that the boundary diffusion matters a lot? Y you're right, and why is that? <coughs> At high temperatures, the uh, volume diffusion is going to be easy. Yeah. Yes. Volume diffusion is easy, and also the boundary thickness is small compared with the amount of volume you have available in front of the interface. So it's exactly like, you know, at part 1b, you did grain boundary diffusion and volume diffusion. Uh, at high temperatures, volume diffusion will dominate. But when you get to low temperatures, the volume diffusion coefficient becomes so small compared with boundary diffusion that much of the flux goes through the boundary itself. So you can see, see that here. If you do the calculation of the growth rate uh, as a function of uh, temperature, for volume and interface diffusion. At low temperatures, the dominant mechanism by which diffusion happens is through the interface rather than uh, through the volume of material. Okay? So the points are simply experimental measurements. Okay? 
Uh, this is just uh, another way of plotting it that the volume diffusion flux is large at high temperatures and relatively small at low temperatures. Okay. Okay, so that actually completes all of the major phase transformations, and we've dealt with uh, growth rates uh, of and, and atomic mechanisms of transformation. And in the next lecture, I will deal with uh, how to calculate time-temperature transformation diagrams, right? Because to design a steel, you know, you need to need to be able to incorporate kinetics, thermodynamics, everything together. Okay.